Bernard here, I hope you're all staying safe and well, and welcome to the Citizen Channel. And one of our regular features, uh, Managing City. Yeah, we'll have a look back at uh, some of the new and oldish and very old and medium uh, time managers at Manchester City of the many, many we've had. Uh, we've had quite a few, haven't we, over the years. So we'll have a look at uh, a manager in time. Going back quite a long way with this one today, which uh, is good because obviously I have to work a little bit harder to try and find things out about the guys. So I don't mind that at all, please. And this guy today is quite unique. He's the only man to actually have managed both Manchester City, the greatest team in the world, our favourite team. If you're a City fan, I mean, you might not be a City fan watching this. You might just like uh, football history and stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, Manchester City and they also managed Manchester United. So they're a very rare occurrence indeed and an interesting link between the two clubs when it, when it happened as well. So join me as we have a look at his stint at City. Uh, there will be a mention, of course, of what he did at United, but uh, and it is a little bit of a case of, of sort of so near but so far. Certainly on the pitch, anyway. But uh, plenty of vision off it, anyway. Did did a lot of good off it as well. So please join me as we have a look at James Ernest Mangnall. Please, if you're new to the channel, push that subscribe button, push the bell notification so you know these vlogs are coming out. Uh, it's mid-season now as I'm doing this, so there's uh, a lot of history stuff. Obviously, once the season starts, there's a lot of uh, current stuff as well. But uh, please, I try and inform and entertain on our wonderful, fantastic football team. So uh, if you can support me, that'd be fantastic. You also see stuff on a, a film and TV channel. Yes, I like my films and TV as well. So if you're interested in that, if you want to have a break from football, have a look at that. There's reviews and information blogs, etc. on there as well. And on screen, you'll find links to Facebook and Twitter. I post loads of stuff, of course, on there. So if you follow or friend me on there, I do check every couple of days and follow and friend everyone back. All your comments on Manchester City or Mr. Mag Magnol, uh, very, very welcome. Uh, as I say, you may have uh, little anecdotes that you can share perhaps that your granddad's told you or whatever obviously uh, about this gentleman so any comments on this or, or anything to do with cities or always very welcome and please uh, if you if you can give us a little thumbs up that's great right let's get on with this one yeah um managing city james ernest magnol we're just going to call him ernest magnol for this uh for this blog because that's what he's he was probably better known as he dropped his first name in the in the same way i dropped my first name uh Obviously, uh, that was because my parents dropped it. I mean, my real name is Charles Bernard Dineen. Very posh, but uh, they always ch drop the Charles and just call me Bernard. So there you go. I've always, I've always been Bernard. So don't, don't use my Sunday name. Uh, there we go. So, yes, uh, Ernest Magnol was born in Bolt in 1866. Yeah, I think some significant in that significance in that date of my, my history now, but I can't remember what it was. Some, some war or other was going on, was it? Franco-Prussian War, or was that 1860? I'm not too sure now, but I forgot, I forgot my history. Yeah, he was a keeper. Keeper was an amateur level. He, he never played uh, as a, at a, a big club or anything like that. And he started his managerial career at Burnley. And he didn't have a great time, actually, despite his uh, his last full season. You know, they actually finished rock bottom of, of the Football League. And in those days, you, you didn't automatically get relegated. It was very rare to get relegated out of the uh, the 92 clubs. in the, Well, it wasn't 92, the clubs in those days. But it was very, very rare. To, you wouldn't, you just, just didn't happen. So, I mean, uh, they got re-elected, fortunately. So they didn't lose the league position. Uh, but it's very strange. Within two months of the 1903-04 season, which was obviously the first season after getting re-election, um, United came calling. So there must have been something there, wasn't there, for United to be this this guy, this guy's team, Burnley, had finished bottom of the bottom of the entire league. But uh, it must have been something there in this guy, and it certainly certainly was. We'll obviously we'll find that out in a in a moment. I mean, he delivered two league titles to United. And an FA Cup as well, which was, uh, you know, quite amazing at the time because uh, City was City were the big club in Manchester. City were the were the, were the guys, you know. City were the were the sort of uh, media guys and the well loved club in Manchester at the time. But uh, he certainly did that for United. But uh, mainly, perhaps because he took four of our players with this illegal illegal payment uh, scandal that rocked City in the early 1900s so I mean uh, United took Billy Meredith their first superstar well he was our first superstar guys but uh, we'll not we'll not quibble about that uh, Jimmy Bannister Sandy Turnbull Herbert Burgess were all key to the success of Manchester United and actually he actually yet took those from City 
Uh, but as I said, despite this success, City was still up there. City was still uh, regarded as the North West leading club, despite two league titles for United and FA Cup compared to, at that time, just one FA Cup for City. Um, so even though it was a little bit of a shock at the time that he actually moved from United to City, he wasn't totally out of left field. But there was an unusual, it was very unusual, the circumstances uh, behind the switch. I mean, it was actually said that prior to the 1912-1913 season, you know, he'd already agreed to manage City, but he stayed on as the United manager. So even though everyone was, uh, everyone knew he was going to manage City, he actually still uh, was officially the United manager. And so for the first game uh, United played that season, he wasn't actually there. He was actually watching Manchester City. And then for the second game, which was the Manchester derby, uh, City actually won that 1-0 and he was absolutely thrilled uh, that City had beaten United even though in theory he was United's manager at the time but uh, yeah by the following Monday it was firmly ensconced in, in the uh, manager's room I thought I suppose he had a room at, uh, at Hyde Road obviously at the time so he was, he was firmly put in the hot seat uh, by Monday the 9th of September uh, 1912 yeah, it started well that season. It did start quite well, but early promise faded a little bit. And uh, United would actually still finish above City. United would finish fourth. Uh, and City would finish sixth that season with uh, Magnol in charge. Uh, but uh, he did lead City to a higher finish the following season, although it wasn't fantastic. We finished uh, we finished 13th and United finished 14th in the 1913-14 season. So it wasn't that great. But, but there we go. By 1914-15, United began to struggle by after losing their manager. Uh, and with a handful of games left, yeah, City had five games left. Uh, and they were the firm, firm favourites to win the first division. Uh, they were actually uh, well on, well on, uh, on track to win it. Uh, but sadly, of the last five games, they drew two and lost three, uh, which meant they actually lost it to, in the end to Everton. Um, uh, and obviously, importantly, the last game at Hyde Road, three games from the end, was actually against Everton. If City had actually won that, that would have pretty much guaranteed the league title. Uh, but unfortunately, Everton beat City, and then even, even with two games left, City could could have still. Uh, clinched the title by winning both and we lost both of them as well so it all sort of went sadly sadly by in 1914-15 season we were so close I mean he nearly led us to a to a title victory which would have been fantastic at the time because City had become City had become one of the most attractive teams to watch uh, there was good crowds being uh, uh, f flooding to, to Hyde Road uh, and obviously to our opponents as well. Obviously, but other other clubs and other other fans are appreciating the sort of style of football City were playing. Uh, but then, yeah, nineteen fourteen fifteen. So obviously during during the early part of last season, obviously uh, we'd we'd gone to war, hadn't we, with Germany? So uh, that put an end to the uh, normal English leagues. It went all provincial and different things were played. So uh, we lost out a little bit there, didn't we? Obviously, as I say, we we very kept, we came close close that fourteen fifteen season, and obviously, more important things obviously than football and and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it came perhaps at the wrong time for City. Uh, Magnol kept kept things ticking over during the war years, and uh, at the end of hostilities, uh, he tried to pick up where he left off, and initially things went quite well. But he also had other worries now. Obviously, after after the the depression of war, I mean, uh, obviously fans wanted some entertainment. They wanted to be taken out of things, didn't they? So obviously the crowds at Hyde Road were were quite large, and the, and the ground itself was was struggling. And as a manager, uh, secretary manager, I think they were called in those days, he was always also responsible for everything else. He was also responsible for the ground and stuff like this. So you know, it's quite a big job. It wasn't just a matter of picking the team and taking, looking at the, you know, doing the training and. Stuff like that, which he probably tended not to do anyway. Um, he was actually worried about other things off the pitch as well. So he sort of had to sort of worry about the, the problems with Hyde Road and the fact it just wasn't big enough. It just wasn't big enough for the big games. It was all right for the run of the mill games, but if there's ever a big game, uh, there's obviously too many too many people trying to get in and people were getting locked out and people were missing out on watch. As I said, City was still, even after the war, still an attractive team to watch. Uh, City finished seventh in the nineteen nineteen twenty season, uh, but in the twenty twenty one season again a bit bit similar to just be just before the war the the uh, sort of would make a better fist of it. Uh, in November nineteen twenty, though disaster struck as uh, we were forced to consider 
a sort of move to Old Trafford or rent to Old Trafford because uh, there was a, a major fire at uh, Hyde Road in November 1920. They weren't quite sure what caused it, a firework or a cigarette or whatever it caused it. It was supposedly around bonfire night as well. Uh, and that dev devastated the, the main grandstand and some of the ground at Hyde Road. Uh, but perhaps, uh, obviously, we did approach United, whether we could rent Old Trafford, which was uh, quite a big ground, quite, quite a good ground, uh, and links to Magnol himself in a moment. But uh, we did approach them uh, to rent the ground, but they just wanted too much money. Uh, uh, the media at the time, uh, neutrals, independents, said United was, you know, could have could have uh, took pity, not pity, well, pity, yeah, if you like, because obviously City had done the same for them over time. But, uh, yeah, United had missed a trick by not... not not sort of offering a decent decent rental if you like so uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of anger at that the the lack that they didn't show the neighbors any sort of love but having said that they were probably still still a bit upset from uh, magnol leaving them those years before so but what it did do was force City to sort of make a minor miracle. They got the you know every, every all all hands to the grindstone as uh, they rebuilt the ground and got it all right. They couldn't put seats in the stand, but they actually made it a banking so you could actually get more people in Hyde Road. Then when they reopened it and actually could get a bigger capacity in, so they actually forced City within two weeks to to bring the ground up to uh, up to the standard to actually have fans again, which which was quite amazing. So United did them a favour in a little way. But uh, yeah, City finished that 2021 season as runners up. Yeah, runners up again as they had in 1904 when we won the FA Cup. We finished runners up that season as well. And by 2020, 21-22, uh, Magnol had been the main advocate now in a move away from East, Man East Manchester. And uh, by 22, 1922, he was ready to announce the move to Moss Side. Uh, he'd also overseen United's move to Old Trafford from their ground, uh, so he had uh, previous for this, so he sort of was always looking to the future. Um, perhaps that caused Magnol to take his eyes slightly off the football inside, I'm not too sure, arranging all this thing. Uh, but City were still playing well, still attracting the fans. Uh, we finished 10th and 8th in our last two seasons at uh, Hyde Road. Uh, not so bad as United had been relegated, and so we're City with a prime force again. Uh, back in Manchester and in the North West uh, and so Magnol led a, a city with a seemingly bright future to uh, their new home at Main Road for the 1923-24 season and he never so nearly came to another triumph that season he, he led City to the uh, FA Cup semi-final fortunately we got beat by Newcastle United 1-0 but uh, Magnol's vision of, of the bigger ground and wanting the bigger ground had paid off. We'd had over 76,000 for an FA Cup game that season against Cardiff City. And so it obviously had proven a, a wise investment and a wise, a wise move. Uh, in May 1924, I mean, of course, Magnol's contract actually ran out. And surprisingly, he didn't get another. Uh, people said he actually... He'd actually jumped, or was he pushed? But people weren't quite sure what had happened. But uh, yeah, I think he felt himself that he'd done as much as he could, and perhaps he, this move and all this uh, thing with the fire at Hyde Road, and then sorting the move out to to Main Road, etc., perhaps took its toll on him a little bit, and uh, he sort of decided to to leave the club. Uh, by mutual consent, I mean, as I say, he certainly wasn't sacked, so uh, there's a, probably a, he probably just thought he would would uh, leave. Well, his health wasn't great. I mean, this was 1924. Don't forget, he did he didn't have a long, long life, so perhaps uh, that was having an effect as well. But he, he moved back to his hometown team, Bolton, as as a director, which obviously left less hands on. Uh, he was actually granted a, a testimonial in a Manchester Manchester uh, combined Manchester team against a Merseyside team so that was that showed how much uh, city had respected what he'd done for them although yeah although he brought no trophy to city he's ensured that uh, city remained at the forefront of uh, of certainly Manchester football and the North West football after after that disastrous FA bans and suspension that we for those illegal payments uh, he then showed that uh, a bit of pride and passion passion was restored to the club and the loyal fans, the fans were turning up in the droves, they say, up, up to as and when. They say, uh, certainly at uh, Main Road, they got bigger crowds than they would have done at Hyde Road. Uh, so the fans were turning up to watch uh, Manchester's famous team still at that stage. Of course, things looked OK. I say United were down in the second division, City were in the first division. They got a brand new ground that could hold almost 90,000 people if need be. 
So that look felt so things look bright and things look he certainly left City in it in a good position when it when he did actually leave City. Uh yeah, his his involvement in the move to Main Road laid the foundation for City's future, of course. There's no doubt that if perhaps the war hadn't intervened, as I say, we came very close in 1914-15. We certainly were playing some good stuff. Who, who knows, he may, he may have replicated what he'd done at United and won us a couple of trophies, a couple of leagues or an FA Cup or whatever, but uh, we'll never know, obviously. Uh, outside of City, yeah, he was also responsible for founding the Central League, the Reserve League for the reserve teams. And he also put together, he was a busy lad, this, a busy, busy guy, this guy, wasn't he? Also founded the uh, Football Managers Association. There you go. So he, he sort of, as I said, off the pitch, he was a very, very busy man. And perhaps that took its toll a little bit. I mean, his stats for City, he played 300, he was in charge of 350 games for City. He won 151. He'd drawn 82 and lost 117. So a, a win percentage of 43.14%. So it's not too bad. That's quite up there. We'd sort of, if you look through all the managers, that's not a bad, bad uh, result at all. Uh, we'd scored 500 goals and let 457 in. So they're not bad. At least, at least it's in the plus column, wasn't it? James Ernest Magnol, I'll call him his, his proper name. Uh, for this at the end, uh, died uh, on 13th of January 1932, so in his mid mid 60s. So uh, yeah, there you go. He was uh, yeah, not the not not uh, not a trophy winner, but he certainly certainly set the seed for something to come. And obviously, the the twenties and the thirties weren't too bad for City, were they? So he he, he started that base for a quite a successful uh, little era before the Second World War. Thanks for joining me for this latest feature of Managing City with uh, James Ernest Magnol. Whatever you're going to do with us today, have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. So we'll meet here again on the Cities and Channel, or perhaps you have a flit across, have a look at my film and TV channel. I only ask one thing of you. Please stay safe, Blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.